once again, I welcome all the participants to the 13th session of research discussion on graphs and groups. May I request Lavanya Selvaganesh from IIT Varanasi to introduce the speaker. Thank you, uh, Dr. Aparna. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for this uh, wonderful event uh, and for giving me the pleasure of introducing today's speaker, Dr. Joy Morris. Uh, I'm so honored to introduce and welcome uh, Dr. Morris uh, from Department of Mathematics and Computer Science, University of Lethbridge, Canada. Her research interests are in combinatorics, in particular algebraic graph theory, or even to be focused, Kelly graphs. So she is interested in using uh, group theory to prove results for Kelly graphs or, or other groups with known automorphisms and graph theoretic properties uh, she's been using them in the context including uh, fault tolerance of automorphism groups and hamilton cycles so personally uh, i had the pleasure of following her work at least for a decade now i should say especially in fault tolerance and uh, applications of uh, kelly graphs so she has also been actively working in the area of uh, graph representations and telegraphs and has published over 50 articles and has written uh, two uh, textbooks for undergrad students, uh, which are titled Combinatorics and, uh, Proof and Con Proofs and Concepts. So she is also actively involved in promoting mathematics education, so where they organize uh, programs for school children as well as uh, for the parents to help them with their mathematics learning and uh, I hope that's a, a really great job that you're doing like, trying to bring back students uh, into the uh, mathematics community especially school students so I'm very happy uh, when I uh, got to know about this so with these few words uh, let me now welcome Dr. Morris to discuss her work on the regular representations scaly graphs with uh, minimal symmetry uh, with us for today. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much. That was a lovely introduction, and thank you for inviting me to speak in this in this discussion. So I'm going to talk today about regular representations, which are Cayley graphs or digraphs or other objects that have minimal symmetry. Um, let me begin by explaining to you where Lethbridge is. As, as was mentioned, it's in Canada. It's right here at the south end of Alberta, just a little bit east of the Rocky Mountains, uh, which are this sort of line between British Columbia and Alberta, and just a little bit north of the United States. So that's where I'm located. What I want to talk about today, as I said, is regular representations. I'll start, start by talking a little bit about group actions in general, uh, give some history and definitions around this problem, talk about some obstructions that sometimes prevent us from having regular representations. I'll touch briefly on asymptotics of the regular representations and uh, some of the main tools that are used in those proofs. And then uh, I'll talk a little bit about some related work and open problems. So beginning with group actions. First of all, I wanna make sure that, that I mentioned at the start that you should assume throughout this talk that the groups I'm using are finite. Some of the results may apply to infinite groups as well, but to, as far as I know, the, the situation for infinite groups and Cayley graphs on infinite groups uh, hasn't been studied much. Okay, so often when we're introducing group theory to students, or at least when I am, we give them some pictures and we ask what are all the symmetries of this object. So this, these are some pictures that appear in a standard undergraduate textbook on group theory. And of course, the answer for this one is we have the cyclic group of order four. You can rotate this object four times. For this one, we have a dihedral group of order eight because we have the four rotations, but we also have four reflections and through the vertical, horizontal and two diagonal axes. Um, and hopefully our, our goal with doing when we present things this way is to give our students some intuitive understanding of the group that we are we are trying to introduce them to. But sometimes that intuition is rather limited. So for example, when our when our students are trying to understand the dihedral group, the interactions between how the rotations work and how the reflections work is maybe a little bit hazy. 
but I think that this is improved if we look at the regular action of a group. So given any group G, it admits a natural permutation action on the set of its own elements by either right or left multiplication. So we can define for any element little g in our group G, we can define an amount tau G by tau G of H is H right multiplied, say, by G for any element H in our group. And this is called the right regular action. If we left, if we left multiply by G instead of right multiplying by G, then that would be the left regular action. And at least when I'm introducing um, Cayley's theorem that every group is isomorphic to a permutation group, this is the this is the method that I use. I show them the right regular or left regular multiple uh, action of the group on itself to show that it's a permutation group on the elements of the group itself, and therefore a, a subgroup of the symmetric group acting on uh, that many elements. This action is regular. Regular means that it's transitive, but it's sharply transitive. So for any two elements in our group, there's a unique um, there's a unique element of our group that maps one of them to the other. So this X and Y are elements of the set on which my, my permutation group is acting, and G is an element of my permutation group, and there's a unique element of my permutation group, or tau G, that maps X to Y by taking G to be X inverse Y. When I right multiply X by that, I will get Y. And that's the only way to get Y by right multiplying by some element of my group. So this means that the action is regular. There's exactly one element that takes any element of, my, of the set on which I'm acting to any other element of the set on which I'm acting. Sometimes, at least in my opinion, the regular action helps the intuition of our students or ourselves more than other group rep representations do. So for example, if we look at the dihedral group of order eight, we can think of it, and we often do, as the set of symmetries or automorphisms of a square. It's got four rotations and four reflections, and uh, just as, as the example of the picture I showed earlier. But again, that maybe doesn't give us a lot of intuition about how the rotations and reflections interact with each other. Whereas if we think of it as the set of automorphisms of this object, which has eight vertices and uh, is a, obviously a directed graph, then it's maybe a little clearer that these, uh, the, what we normally think of as the reflection or the reflections in D8 interchange the inner cycle with the outer cycle and uh, and in doing so they reverse the orientation and the rotation of course simply rotates the whole object and so the the fact that interchanging the inner cycle with the outer cycle reverses the orientation of those two cycles hopefully allows us to gain that intuition that when we do a reflection it inverts the rotation so let me talk a little bit about some history and definitions around uh, what I'm going to discuss. So Koenig in 1936 asked, given an abstract group G, is there a graph whose automorphism group is isomorphic to G? And Frucht in 1938 said, yes, in fact, there are infinitely many such graphs for any group. But in general, the constructions that, that were arrived at don't have regular group actions. They have way more vertices than the size of the group, and therefore uh, there are not automorphisms that take any vertex to any other vertex. For example, for the cyclic group of order five, here is a representation, a graph whose automorphism group is, um, is cyclic of order five. But in order to avoid having any reflections, as well as these five rotations, we added a lot of vertices to 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 ensure that we can't when we're take when we're mapping this vertex at the top say to this vertex at the right we can't do it by reflecting through this axis so a graph is a collection of vertices with edges joining some of them i'm sure you're all familiar with that a digraph is a collection of vertices with arcs meaning directed edges joining some of them so we put arrows on some of those edges 
And if we happen to have arcs in both directions between two vertices, then we often represent this just by an edge rather than two arcs. And an oriented graph is a directed graph that does not have arcs in both directions between any two vertices. So it's what you might get if you start with a graph and you have to choose for every edge in that graph, you have to choose whether it goes one direction or the other direction. You're not allowed to, to let it go in both directions. That's an oriented graph. And for any of these objects, if we find an object of that type whose full automorphism group is the regular representation of some group G, then we call that, that graph or digraph or oriented graph a graphical regular representation of G or a digraphical regular representation of G, or I suppose it should be oriented graphical regular representation, but we just say oriented regular representation of G. And we abbreviate those as GRR, DRR, or ORRs for the group G. So for example, again, here is the graph of a cycle of length four. This is not a DRR, a GRR, or an ORR for any group because its full automorphism group is D8. And the action of D8 is not regular on the vertices of this graph. It's got eight elements, the four reflections, as well as the four rotations. And therefore, there's not a unique element taking any vertex to any other vertex. However, if we take this object that we saw earlier, this is a digraphical regular representation for D8 because its full automorphism group is the, di the dihedral group of order 8, and the action of D8 is, act is regular on the vertices of this digraph. There are eight vertices and eight elements of D8, and there is, in fact, one of them that takes any vertex to any other vertex, the, reflect the rotations, spin us round, and as I said, the reflections switch the inner cycle with the outer cycle. It's not a graph, and it's not an oriented graph. It's not a graph because some of the edges have directions on them. It's not an oriented graph because some of the edges don't have directions on them. So it's not a GRR, and it's not an ORR, just simply because it's not an object of those types. Here's another example. This is a GRR, so a graphical regular representation for D12, the dihedral group of order 12. Its full automorphism group is dihedral of order 12, and the action of that dihedral group is regular on the vertices of this graph. And it is also a digraph, because any graph can be thought of as a digraph, and uh, therefore it is a DRR, but it's not an oriented graph because these edges do not ha all have directions to them, so it's not an ORR. So I think probably you're all familiar in this, in this group with Cayley graphs, but let me go over the definition very quickly. A Cayley graph or, direct, or a Cayley directed graph is uh, defined on a group G with a connection set H, it's a connection set S. It's the digraph whose vertices are the elements of G, and we put an arc from G to G left multiplied by an element S, if and only if that little s is in the connection set S. We will get a graph if and only if the connection set is closed under inverses, because if we want a graph, then anytime we have an edge going one way, an arc going one way, we need the corresponding arc coming back the other way. And to get that from, that def from this definition, we need to have some element of our connection set such that when we left multiply it by SG, we get back to G. And that element clearly has to be S inverse. S inverse SG gives us back G. So we'll get that reverse arc if and only if whenever little s is in S, little s inverse is also in S. So if and only if that connection set S is closed under inversion. And right multiplying um, every vertex of the Cayley graph by any element of our group is necessarily an automorphism of any Cayley graph or digraph, because if I write multiply two vertices G and SG by some element H, I get GH and SGH. And by our definition, because S is an element of S, there is an arc from GH to SGH. So right multiplication preserves the, de the way we've defined arcs or edges in our graph, and therefore it will be will produce an automorphism of our graph. So 
Cayley graphs always have this right regular representation that I've been talking about as some of the automorphisms of the, of the, the graphs. And Sabadusi observed this a long time ago, that a graph or digraph is a Cayley graph or digraph on the group G. I'm sorry, is someone asking me something? Participants, uh, please mute your mic if you don't have anything to ask. Okay. Uh, so a graph or digraph is a Cayley uh, graph or digraph on our group G, if and only if their group of automorphisms contains the right regular representation of G. Uh, so I mentioned that it will always will contain that right regular representation. And conversely, if you have a graph that has the right rec regular representation of a group in its automorphism group, then it will be a Cayley graph or digraph. And therefore, if we want a DRR or a GRR or an ORR, they have to have the right regular representation of G not only in their automorphism group, but as their entire automorphism group, then that means that they are Cayley graphs or digraphs that have no other automorphisms beyond that right regular representation. Okay, so now let me start talking about obstructions. When can this fail? When does this necessarily fail to happen? So first of all, if we have a Cayley digraph and we have a group automorphism of our group G, let's call it alpha, and that group automorphism happens to fix the connection set S setwise, then we can define a map um, from that group automorphism. We can use that group automorphism to define a map on the vertices of the graph, and that map will be an automorphism of our graph. So let me just explain that with a quick proof. Suppose there is an arc from G to SG, so S is an element of our connection set. Since alpha is a group automorphism, if we let alpha act on SG, we get the image of S followed by the image of G. And since alpha fixes S, the image of S under alpha is also an element of S. And that means there is an arc from the image of G under alpha to the image of S under alpha, the image of G under alpha, which is the image of SG under alpha. And that means that alpha has preserved this arc from G to SG into the arc from G alpha to SG to the alpha. Okay, so if alpha is an a group automorphism that preserves our connection set, then it gives us an automorphism of the graph. If we look at abelian groups, uh, a very simple exercise for, for group theory students is to ask them to prove that a group is abelian if and only if the map that inverts every group element is a group automorphism. And when we have graphs, as I mentioned earlier, if you want to have a, gra a Cayley graph rather than a digraph, then the connection set will be closed under inversion, and therefore this map that inverts every element of the group has to fix every element of ev every connect, whatever our connection set is, has to be fixed by that group automorphism. And therefore, a Cayley graph on the group cannot be a GRR because it will always have this extra automorphism, except if this map that inverts every element happens to be the identity map, then that isn't an extra automorphism, that's just the identity automorphism. And that will, of course, be true if and only if every element of the group is its own inverse, in other, other words, has order two. So that's a case, abelian groups, except if alpha is the identity map, this alpha being the map that inverts every element, those cannot have GRRs. Generalized dicyclic groups are groups defined, uh, so we start with an abelian group A and we add, so we, we identify, and it has to be, have even order, and we identify an, an element of order two in A and call it Y. Then we can generate a group from the elements of A and a new element X that's not in A, define the square of X to be Y, that involution that we've identified in A, and define X to invert every other element, of, well, every element of A. Then 
this creates a group that we call the generalized dicyclic group over A. And in the, this generalized dicyclic group, there is a group automorphism, a map iota, defined that it fixes every element in the abelian group and inverts every element in that other coset, the coset that contains X of the abelian group. This is a group automorphism for any generalized dicyclic group. And again, if we look at what it does to the connect to any connection set S that it happens to be closed under inversion, well, since it either fixes or inverts every element of the group, it has to fix any connection set that is closed under inversion as a set. And therefore, a Cayley graph on a generalized dicyclic group can also never be a GRR because it will always have this extra automorphism iota. And in this case, iota can never be the identity. So we really do always get an extra automorphism. So this was observed a long time ago. Lewis Nowitz in 1968 uh, found one of these exceptions and Mark Watkins in 1971 found the other. Uh, so abelian groups that contain a non-involution, so in other words, have, that have exponent of greater than two are not elementary abelian, uh, two groups, and also generalized dicyclic groups <coughs> cannot have GRRs because they always get these extra automorphisms. A Cayley graph or digraph will be connected if and only if the connection set generates our group G. So I some people define Cayley graphs to have to be connected, but I do not require that necessarily, typically when I'm thinking of Cayley graphs, but certainly it will be connected if and only if the connection set happens to generate the, uh, the full group. And if we have a disconnected Cayley graph or digraph, and it has more than two vertices, then it will not be a regular representation. So let me prove that. If we take a graph that has no edges, so yeah, and more than two vertices, then its automorphism group is the symmetric group, and that certainly does not act regular regularly on n vertices as long as n is bigger than two. So we can assume that the connection set is not empty, but it doesn't generate all of our group take an element of our connection set and we'll define a map alpha to fix every element of our connection set, uh, sorry, every element of the group generated by our connection set, um, but to map any other element to that element right multiplied by X, by S. And because right multiplying by S fixes the group generated by our connection set set wise, this is an automorphism of our graph, and the automorphism group of the graph, therefore, has more than one element fixing the identity. It has this alpha, and it also has the identity element, and therefore, it's not regular. Let me give a little proof by picture. We take this. These are some connected components of our graph. Well, this is the connected component uh, that can take the consisting of the group generated by S. And these are sort of all of the other connected components. And we fix all of the vertices in this one. Over here, we multiply everything on the right by S. And because there aren't any edges between these, we can do that without, without creating a problem for ourselves. We know right multiplication by S is an automorphism of the entire group. So if we right multiplied everything by S, that would be an automorphism of our graph. Sorry, of the graph. Um, but because this is a separate connected component, we can just leave it alone instead of right multiplying it by S and everything is fine in terms of preserving the edges. So again, a Cayley digraph is connected if and only if its connection set generates the group and a disconnected di Cayley digraph I just proved that has more than two vertices cannot be a regular representation. So if we have a group that has more than two elements and it can't be generated without elements of order two, then it can't have an oriented regular representation because for an oriented regular representation, remember we need each, um, each edge to be an arc to have a direction associated with it. And if we have an element of order two in our connection set, then the, its inverse is also in our connection set because it is its own inverse. 
And therefore, we get an edge from that rather than arcs. And so we can't get an oriented graph. So if we have to throw in an element of order two into our connection set in order to generate the whole group, then we're going to have edges in our graph, not just arcs. And therefore, we can't have oriented graphs as regular representations because we can't have, yeah, we can't have connected oriented Cayley die graphs on this group. Okay, so this is the same abstraction. And now let me talk about a type of family of groups that, that has this property. So if we take an abelian group A, we can define a generalized dihedral group over the group A by adding an element of x, an element x whose square is the identity and that inverts every element of A. So if A is cyclic, this is the traditional dihedral group. And if A is not cyclic, then it's a, gener a strictly generalized dihedral group. And in this group, if we take any element that's not in the group A, the subgroup A, so any element in that other coset, and we square it, because x inverts A, we get AX, AX. Well, X is also its own inverse. So X inverts A here. So I, when I pass the X past the A, I get an A inverse. So I have A times A inverse times X squared. A times A inverse is obviously the identity. X has order two. So this gives us the identity. So every element in this coset has order two because when I square, squared it, I got the identity. And that means that I cannot generate this whole generalized dihedral group without an element of order two, because if I take any element that doesn't have order two, it has to have been in this abelian subgroup. So I can never get to that other coset without using an element of order two. This means that generalized dihedral groups do not admit oriented regular representations. And this was observed by Babai back in 1980. So oriented regular representations are special kinds of digraphical regular representations because oriented graphs are special kinds of digraphs. Also, GRRs are special DRRs because graphs are special kinds of digraphs. So if we want to think about what could be obstructions for a DRR, for having a DRR, it would have to be an obstruction from having an ORR and it would have to be an obstruction from having a GRR. And certainly the examples we've seen that are obstructions for either are not obstructions for both. There's no overlap in the cat in those classes of groups that we that I've talked about. And in fact, there are no sort of general obstructions that keep us from having digraphical regular representations. If we look at bipartite GRRs, this is another um, aspect that some people have studied. So this is a graphical regular representation that has to be a bipartite graph, then we need to, to have the, the, bipart the bipartition has to be defined by a subgroup, let's call it M of index two. And if we have such a subgroup and there is a non-identity automorphism that maps every element of the other coset, the coset that, doesn't, that isn't M to either G or, itself or its inverse, then we can't get a bipartite GRR that has these cosets of M as the bipartition sets. So this is some this is quite similar to um, to some of our other obstructions. And in a very recent paper, Du Feng and Spiga showed that the groups and subgroups of M that have such an automorphism, well, they characterize them. I'm showing you the result, but but it's very detailed and technical and I don't want to get into the details. Let's just say they characterized groups that that have this autom an automorphism that prevents them from having a bipartite GRR. So now the big lesson out of all of this is that other than these obstructions that are sort of obvious that I've talked about where the group itself prevents us from getting a GRR because it has a group automorphism that create that gives us a graph automorphism that is not just the I yeah that that uh, that fixes our connection set. So 
unless we have a situation like that, we generally can always find a regular representation. So this is, in the case of graphs, this was the theorem while well, Hetzel in 1976 completed the, uh, the solvable part of this result, and then Godsell in his PhD thesis in 1981 finished the result by dealing with non-solvable groups. And so they showed that with the exception of abelian groups that don't have exponent two, so that first class of, of graphs that have an automorphism, sort of groups that have an automorphism that prevents them from having a GRR. And with the exception of generalized dicyclic groups, the other group that has an ob obvious obstruction. And then there are 13 other groups of order at most 32 that do not have GRRs. Other than that, every group has a graphical regular representation. And Babai in 1980 showed that the corresponding result for DRRs, there are in this case five small exceptions of order at most 16. Other than those, every group has a digraphical regular representation. And Pablo Spiga and I in 2018 showed that with the exception of generalized dihedral groups, again, the obvious obstruction that we've already discussed, and 11 other small groups of order at most 64, every group has an oriented regular representation. And then for the bipartite uh, regular representations, Dufeng and Spiga conjectured in 2020 that with 59 exceptions of order at most 64, the groups that are classified by their, that they classified with the obvious obstruction are the only groups that don't admit bipartite graphical regular representations. At the moment, that's only a, a conjecture, but they were able to prove it in the case where that, uh, that index two subgroup is abelian. I think I'll mention that shortly, but okay. So this is the theorem by Babai and, sorry, sorry, just lost my screen share, I think, there. Theorem by Babai and Imrich from 1979, every group of odd order admits a tournament regular representation. So a regular representation that's actually a tournament has an arc in one direction or, a, or the other between any pair of vertices. So this is actually a special kind of oriented regular representation. And you can only have a tournament that is a Cayley graph if your group actually has odd order. So that odd order is a necessary condition just to get a tournament that has a, a regular subgroup in its automorphism group. Uh, and the, there is one exception, the direct product of two cyclic groups of order three doesn't even admit a digraphical regular representation. It's one of the, uh, uh, one of the exceptions that Babai found for having digraphical regular representations. So it certainly, it doesn't have a tournament regular representation either. Du, Feng, and Spiga in their recent work on the bipartite uh, case, as I mentioned just recently, showed that every group that has an abelian subgroup of index two, so if we assume that that index two subgroup is abelian, then they were able to show that they we do get a bipartite digraphical regular representation with the cosets of M being the bipartition group, bipartition sets, except with 22 small exceptions of order at most 64. Um, and this is particularly interesting, this bipartite uh, it work, because the major techniques that have been used for finding digraphical regular representations involve looking at the subgraph that is induced on the neighbors of the vertex and trying to make sure that it has no automorphisms. And if you can prove that that subgraph has no automorphisms, then uh, then your Cayley graph will not have any extra automorphisms. If we fix one vertex, we fix its neighborhood, and therefore we end up fixing the entire graph. But this technique does absolutely nothing for bipartite graphs, because if you're in a bipartite graph and you look at the subgraph induced on the neighborhood of a vertex, it will be a set of independent vertices. So it will have lots and lots of automorphisms. And as I mentioned, Du Feng and Spiga in 2020 can 
conjectured that they don't need this assumption that M is abelian, but they weren't able to prove it without that assumption. So the big theme or lesson that I hope you take away from, from all that I've talked about with regular representations is that with the exception of some small noise, group, little groups, little exceptional groups where it's just too small and something goes wrong, regular representations exist as long as we avoid some obvious structural obstructions that typically relate to the group structure. Let me talk now about asymptotics for a bit. So Erdős and Renyi in 1963 proved that almost every graph and almost every digraph is asymmetric, so has no automorphisms at all. And the idea of this is that symmetry is rare. So maybe we can say that having extra symmetry is also rare. So if we have a Cayley graph, we know it has some symmetry, but maybe even though we're forcing it to have some symmetry, maybe it's rare for it to have any extra symmetry, any extra automorphisms. Maybe it will almost always be a regular representation. So yeah, this is the question. If we force a graph or digraph to have some symmetry, is it still true that um, it will almost always have no symmetry beyond the symmetry that we force it to have? So again, Baba in 1980 showed that with sm five small exceptions, every group has a DRR. And Baba and Godzel in 1981 and 82, a couple of papers, conjectured that as the number of vertices tends to infinity, the number of digraphical regular representations on that number of vertices tends to one as a proportion of the number of Cayley digraphs on our vertices. There are different ways of making this very precise, um, but, uh, but yeah, this was their conjecture that essentially almost every Cayley digraph is a DRR. So this is their conjecture and a couple of remarks. Whether or not we allow the identity to be in the connection set is irrelevant. We can have a loop at every vertex that doesn't affect the automorphism group. So we can allow that or not allow that, it doesn't matter. This means that we can take the number of Cayley digraphs on a group of order R to be two to the R because we can choose any subset of our group to be the connection set. We're looking at digraph rather than a graph, so we don't need it to be closed under inversion. We just choose any subset to be our connection set, and there are two to the R choices that we can make. Um, and another question you can ask from the way this is phrased is, is it true that every group, for any group of order R, almost every in some, uh, in some sense, uh, Cayley digraph is a GRR, or is it only sort of true over all groups of order R as R tends to infinity? Of course, it doesn't really make sense to talk about almost every if we have a finite collection, but, um, but still, there are ways to think about this problem in which that does make sense. And also, we can look at labeled digraphs, labeled Cayley digraphs. So if we have, if we maintain that we need a particular labeling, or we can look at digraphs up to isomorphism. So for example, there are lots of different ways to label the complete Cayley graph as a digraph on a particular group, because we could use any possible permutation of the, of the labels on those vertices. But, uh, and, and those would all be different labeled digraphs, and so that would significantly affect how our counting is working. Or we can look at just having one complete Cayley graph and look at that up to isomorphism. And they also made a similar conjecture about GRRs and Cayley graphs rather than digraphs. So they proved a special case of this, of this conjecture. They proved that if we only look at nilpotent groups, um, so we only look at Cayley graphs on nilpotent groups, then and and they have to have odd order. Then, as R tends to infinity, the proportion of DRRs on R from all Cayley digraphs tends to one. So it's a special case if we're only looking at nilpotent groups of odd order. And Pablo Spiga and I proved 
I guess that should be 2021 plus, it hasn't appeared yet, that the Babai Godsell conjecture is actually true. So the precise formulation we got is that if we take a group of order R and R is sufficiently large, then the number of subsets that don't give us a DRR, so the number of subsets of possible connection sets that don't give us a DRR is at most two to the R minus this lovely factor in terms of R. B is an absolute constant that doesn't connect, depend on R. And the point is that this is vanishingly small relative to two to the R. So almost always, so we have a few, we have a bound, an upper bound on the number that give us things that aren't DRRs, and therefore almost everything does give us a DRR. So as R tends to infinity, the proportion of DRRs out of all Cayley digraphs tends to one. And this is true whether we look at graphs, labeled graphs or graphs up to isomorphism, or sorry, digraphs. I'm going to quickly go through some of the main tools that we talked about that we used in this result. So we use blocks in the automorphism group. So if we have a permutation group acting transitively on a set X and we have a subset of that, then it is a block under the action of G if every element of our permutation group G either fixes, um, either fixes that block or maps it to something completely disjoint. So as an example, if we look at the action of a group on the, on the vertices of a cube, if we took this particular subset of vertices, this is not a block because I can map it to this subset of vertices and there is an overlap, but they are not the same. So these two sets overlap, but aren't the same and therefore do not create a block in the automorphism group. Oh, and, and they can be mapped to each other by an automorphism of the cube. And so they're not a block. But if I take these two sets of vertices that are diametrically opposite, they are a block because there is no way to map these two sets of vertices to, to map one of them to one of these two vertices without mapping the other to the other. <coughs> and in fact, we can take all of the pairs of diametrically opposite vertices. So we get the pair of green ones, the pair of red ones, the pair of blue ones, and the pair of black ones. These create all of the possible blocks that we get as images of that first block, that first green block, those two green vertices under various automorphisms of the cube. And they, they give us a partition of the vertices of our cube. And more generally, that, that technique gives us a partition of the set of, uh, of on which we're acting. So our broad strategy was that we had existing results that covered all cases, except if the group of automorphisms was actually exponential in the number of vertices. Intuitively, that case should be easy to cover. If we have lots and lots of automorphisms, then, uh, then that should really limit what, what the graph looks like. But despite that intuition, it was not easy to finish off the proof. So we use these, this idea of blocks. A permutation group that admits blocks is called imprimitive, and it has actions on the set of blocks and actions on each block. And we can use induction by, uh, by looking at the action on the set of blocks, looking at the action on each block. And a permutation group that does not admit blocks is primitive. So this supplies sort of the base case for our inductions. And to solve that base case, we use the Onan-Scott classification of primitive groups. One key lemma that I want to mention, because it's one of the big obstructions from getting a similar result for graphs rather than digraphs, which was also a conjecture of Babai and Godsell, if we have a transitive permutation group that's acting on R points and it's not regular, then there are at most two to three R over four digraphs on these R points whose automorphism group contains G. Um, this is really easy to prove, um, but I don't want to go through the proof of this just, uh, just 
now because I realize that I've taken a lot of my time and I have a few other things I want to still say. So the proof, though, you can see is, is short and easy. And uh, it, it, but it does heavily rely on the fact that we have a, a digraph rather than a graph. So this particular lemma has no obvious useful general, generalization when we're dealing with graphs. And it's the main reason that our proofs don't, uh, don't give us the result for graphs rather than just digraphs. So I want to finish off with some related work and open problems. First of all, I mentioned recent work on bipartite DRRs by Du Feng and Spiga, and they showed that they Du Feng and Spiga showed some asymptotics in this case also. So they proved again in the special case where that index two subgroup is abelian, they proved that almost every bipartite Cayley graph is a DRR. Alsbach in 1974 first published the question that's related to the question I started with. So not just given a particular group, is there a graph whose, uh, whose automorphism group is that, is, is that group? But if we look at a particular representation of a permutation group, is there a graph whose automorphism group is isomorphic to that group as, a, as permutation groups. So really what I've been talking about for most of today is if we're looking at the regular representations of any particular, any, of any group, answer, how can we answer this question? Um, but there are other representations. There aren't other representations that every group has, like the regular representation, but there are other representations that families of groups have. And one particular representation, the Frobenius re uh, representation is a standard one. It only, of course, applies to Frobenius groups. But a number of researchers, including Watkins, Tucker, Condor, and Spiga, have proved some results about Frobenius representations of permutation groups. So let me conclude with some open problems. Is the Babai Godzel conjecture true for graphical regular representations? This is still unknown. So the asymptotics of graphical regular representations are not well understood. It, it, we're pretty convinced that it's true, but we can't prove it at this point. Are the dufeng spiga conjectures, so the ones about bipartite regular representations, are they true in general for bipartite GRRs? So if we eliminate the abelian, can, the condition that the index two subgroup be abelian, can we still prove, can you still prove their results? And that's where I'm stopping. Uh, thank you, Professor Morris. Uh, I think I'll leave the session for others for any questions. Uh, and the other thing is, if I could just make one remark, you said you weren't talking about infinite groups, and that's fine because the picture is so very different for infinite groups. But uh, I will just remark that there is a wide class of countably infinite groups for which exactly the reverse of your results is true. That is, if you pick a random Cayley graph, let's say, for the uh, infinite group, then with probability one, it's isomorphic to the Ed Rainey random graph, and it has a huge automorphism group. So right. uh, not much chance of uh, getting uh, GRR results there, I think. Right, thanks, yeah. Okay, so that, that's my questions. Uh, I have one basic uh, question uh, to you, Professor Morris. In the case of D12, uh, at the beginning of the lecture, you mentioned that the, uh, it's a GRR, right? Uh, yeah, D12, D12. And, D12. Yeah. and it, it is also hence a DRR, you concluded it that way. So can we say in general, like if any graph is a GRR, I mean any uh, uh, group has a GRR, then can we say there exists an orientation which we could uh, assigned to the graph to make it a DRR? Okay, so the yes, but uh, but it's it's the it's the sort of obvious thing that any graph is a digraph by just replacing every edge by the arcs in both directions. So you have yeah. to replace each edge by two arcs, one going in one direction and the other going the other direction. That's yeah. still a digraph. It's not an oriented graph, but it is a digraph. Mm -hmm. 
and therefore it gives us a digraphical regular representation. Yeah. So that's what can we do this? Give this as a generalization. Like if we have a GRR, then there is an obvious DRR which is which can be attached to any uh, representation. Yeah. Yes, every GRR but, is a DRR just by replacing the yeah. edges by by digons. Yeah. So only difference is that it will not be an or unless there is a very specific orientation we attach to it. Right. That's right. Yes. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I have one question. Uh, we know that, I mean, if we have a Kelly graph, then, I mean, it, al it always admits a sharply transitive, I mean, subgroup. But instead of having a subgroup, if we have a subset, I mean, then can we say something about that graph? I mean, I'm. Uh, I mean, I'm asking that if we have a graph whose automorphism yeah. group have a sharply transitive subset instead of a subgroup, if we have a subset, I mean, it will be a vertex transitive graph, but yeah, it so will it'll be a vertex like transitive graph. So it will be something in between that. So is there a name to that or any particular type of? Yeah. So I mean, a graph that has a vertex. Well. These are vertex transitive graphs. You're, yeah. If if we have a sharply vertex transitive subgroup, sub subset, then that yes. just means our graph is is vertex transitive. And in general, again, Sabadusi came up with uh, with conditions, and the vertex transitive graphs are all coset graphs. Okay, but so I mean, they can, I mean, if I mean, what I'm they asking can all be is formed by the group by taking double cosets, um, yeah, by defining the vertices to be, uh, yeah, the connection set via double cosets. I don't work very much with vertex transitive graphs or that construction, so I can't uh, give you the details off the top of my head. But uh, yeah, again, it's double coset graphs defined by Sabadusi give us, give us a way to characterize all vertex transitive graphs from, um, from the groups. Okay, but my question is that I mean, does every vertex transitive graph uh, always allow a sharply transitive subset? Yes, I mean you can you can just pick if if you've got a vertex transitive graph and all you want is a subset, you can just pick a set of of uh, of uh, oh I see what you're saying. Sorry. Um, I think it's it's something stronger than what yeah, you're yeah you're right I see I see what you're asking I I'm not positive the answer of that anyone else want to ask a question or add any comments yeah I have uh, two points to clarify you following the fruits theorem you gave a example of a graph uh, whose uh, automorphism group is z5 yeah is it the smallest graph or is it one graph I believe this one is the smallest um, for, for Z5. Um, yeah. Okay, following the construction given in the proof, isn't it? Yeah. So are yeah. there any, any other graph with this property? Oh, who's, uh, who's, that have this many vertices or whose automorphism group is Z5 or what? Automorphism group is Z5. Yes. I mean, you could, you could keep going. We could add um, another string of say four vertices here and here and here and here and here. There are infinitely many we could construct, but they will they will have more and more vertices typically. So, is there any possibility of uniqueness? Um, there might be a unique smallest, but no. In general, there are, there are actually, in fact, yeah, fruit as I said showed that for any group there are, you can find infinitely many graphs um, that have that group as their automorphism group. Okay, another thing is that you you mentioned in one of the slides that almost every graph is asymmetric. Yes. Uh, what did you mean by that? So almost every graph has no automorphisms. If yeah, so this is this is a result by Erdos and Renyi. Yeah. And uh, and yeah, they proved that 
it's, it's actually not very obvious from, from the papers that are usually cited for it, in, in my opinion, but it is a, a, it is a consequence of some of their work that, sorry, I'm trying to find it, but it is certainly a consequence of some of their work that, uh, that almost every digraph has no automorphisms. So the automorphism group is trivial. Can you give some more information on this identity graph? Identity trees or something? Any references or? The identity? I'm not uh, sure you asked, sorry. The automorphism group is only identity. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, Joy, when you yeah. say almost every, this is sort of an asymptotic result, is it? Yes, it is. That is as the, after a certain large enough number of vertices, how does that work? I mean, yeah, so it's basically as the number of vertices tends to infinity, the proportion of graphs or digraphs that uh, on that number of vertices that have no automorphisms tends to one. Yes, I that, think that, yeah. that, uh, that there are no further questions. May I now request Professor Rambad Vijaykumar to propose the word of thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Joy Morris. In fact, uh, I should thank uh, Peter Cameron also for suggesting this speaker uh, who gave an excellent uh, lecture. Personally, all the more happy because you are interested in activities of school math education. I am also involved in for the last 30 years by writing articles about mathematics in our language and uh, involved in the math Olympiad also. Um, so as a whole, I'm really happy that uh, uh, we, our, your talk was very well received. And uh, on behalf of all of us, uh, thank you very much, Joy Morris. We'll meet, keep on meeting somewhere. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah.